What's up, guys? Chad Hamilton here with 74 Weld, here with the owner of Quinn Poults. And uh, we're going to talk portals today. We're going to go through all of our platforms from race down to Jeep to our new IFS stuff, Tacoma and Bronco. Yeah, so our goal also on this is to just give like an in-depth dive. We're going to crack open some of this stuff so you can see internals. And then more importantly, we're going to talk about in-depth um, technical stuff on how we develop the tech that we have and why it's right or why it's you know what we feel is the best stuff out there so we'll start with our race portal um, this one right here is it's a display that we bring to all of our shows this is the front corner off uh, Vaughn Gittin Jr. and Lauren Healy's Ultra 4 cars um, but we've done these for trophy trucks for Brenthal for Geyser um, and a handful of others and then this same essentially from the box out um, this is run i don't know on a bunch of different vehicles everything from the 4600 bronco jason shear's new car um, we had 17 vehicles across three classes at king of the hammers this year um, running some iteration of our race stuff so our race stuff is basically built around a Spider Tracks Pro Series unit bearing. Um, this is the 56 spline one, and our lower gear integrates into that. It's a three bearing lower package, um, but the whole point of, of everything that we do on race is race is expensive. So there is not a single bolt that touches aluminum. Everything runs threaded inserts. Everything runs 17.4 heat treated inserts for all steering components. This is kind of the best of the best, no hold barred. Um, but what we do with this is we're able to basically test and validate a gear package in what we would argue is the most demanding application possible. So you know, there's going to be debate what's harder on things, an Ultra 4 vehicle, a trophy truck. We're not going to dive into that today, but I'll tell you that testing on race, and this is just a blanket statement that I will make that I'll stand behind, and I think anybody that's raced would stand behind this as well, is one weekend of racing is probably better than years of product development and product testing in typical trail wheeling style. So race cars just get pushed so much harder than what we're able to do on the trail. We know that if it will live in a race application, it's gonna live that when we scale it and when we put it in something like this, um, depending on how that's scaled. But this whole package here, so this is our Jeep portal, this basically came out of race. Um, so we took our race package, been testing it, and we wanted to move something to the production, streetable, yeah. Jeeps, Tacomas, yep. everything else. So this is our production platform that we were able to take our design from here, downsize it a little bit, and put it in a consumer package. Yeah, and so this platform here, we have different design constraints. So this is actually kind of an unconstrained platform. Um, we've got you know, a bunch of different brake packages. When we get down into this, we want you to be able to run as much OE stuff as physically possible. So this bearing pack that we have custom made for us takes a factory wheel speed sensor, so you're fully ABS compatible. Um, it'll hold a factory caliper. Um, we try to maintain as much, um, all the geometry on this is all factory, but really, I guess uh, the portion that I think is worth diving into is really the gear set and gear development. And one of the main reasons we bring up race is that our gear set and our gear tooth profile and all of that stuff was developed in race. It's nearly identical to what we run in our Jeep package, which is also the same gear set that we're running on this Tacoma. And it's the same gear set that we run in Bronco. So, you know, we started out with Jeep and we consistently run V8s and 40s on this. When you move over to the Tacoma, it's the same gear set. So V8s and 40s, we're running a V6 and 37s on this. We don't really foresee any issues, um, but this will put things in perspective. So this is the gear 
that's currently in our race portal, this is the gear that's in our Jeep and Tacoma and Bronco portal. So it's one eighth of an inch narrower and it is exactly 10% smaller. And what we did was we basically, we took what we know was working and we said, okay, what's the minimum that we need to scale it down to get the ratio that we want to fit in a package with the factory brake and all the other constraints that we had. And that's where we ended. Can we talk ratio real quick? What this is, why we chose it? Sure. So um, this is just an idler gear. And so if you look at, and I don't have the second idler here, so we'll talk about that real briefly. Um, three gear versus four gear. Um, we run a four gear because if you just run three, you allow for more room for a brake package, but you're sacrificing a ton of contact patch. And that's where a lot of the strength comes. So we add a second idler, that second idler distributes load. Um, and so this ratio here is a 1.22. And the reason we choose a 1.22 is because across all platforms, all we're trying to do is accommodate for a larger tire size. So if your Jeep came with a 32, a 22% larger tire is like a 39 and a half. If your Tacoma came with a 30, a 22% larger tire is a 36 and a half, 37. Um, so we're just trying to keep as much factory tire size geometry gearing. Now you're going to a 22% larger tire, but your drivetrain still thinks that it's running a factory tire. It's gonna have more weight, but for gear purposes and all that, this is just your re-gear to re-gear you back to factory, given that you're gonna run a large tire. Um, so I think, what, we wanna dive into gear sets? Yeah, gear, bearing package. Ah, so gears and bearings. Um, bearings, I would argue, is one of the most critical features or critical components of a portal. Um, on, on this set here, which is in both of these, so we essentially run, uh, we run two cylindrical roller bearings on the upper. Um, we run two cylindrical rollers on our idler gears, and then our lower gear indexes into the unit bearing, and that unit bearing has two either tapered rollers, well, it has two opposing tapered rollers, and additionally, we put a large needle bearing into the backside. So your lower gear package is actually a three bearing lower, making it super strong. Um, so I get a lot of questions about essentially gear noise and straight cut versus helical cut and why you want one versus the other. And there seems to be a trend of talking about straight cut gears are noisy and helical gears are quiet. And the problem with that is it's not really an accurate statement. Um, gear noise has nothing to do with straight cut versus helical cut. It has everything to do with what's a concept called contact ratio. And helical gears will inherently have a higher contact ratio than a straight cut gear because as you're traveling along that helix, you're gonna have more teeth in contact at any given time. That's essentially the dumbed down version of contact ratio. But with the gear software that we use, we're able to tweak the gear profile to get a contact ratio. And if you get it above a certain number, you're not gonna hear noise out of them. So I get that people are concerned about noise. Um, I will tell you flat out that the gear sets are not noisy. Um, part of that also has to do with the fact that you're not actually spinning at a high RPM at the wheel. So when you do get up to say 80, 90 miles an hour, um, I'll tell you flat out that you're not going to hear any gear noise. Now, a lot of that is because this is only running at say six, 700, 800 RPM. But a lot of that also is just due to the fact that the tooth profile that we use is a good contact ratio and therefore it's quiet you're always going to hear your tires before you hear yeah gears. totally you're going to hear tires long before gears 
Um, I've had the Jeep up to 100. I didn't really want to go any faster. You're still not getting any gear noise um, really so at all. So with that speed, you know, we, we do a lot of highway miles and stuff. We've done a lot of long drives. We were yep. driving through Arizona. A lot of people ask about heat and stuff. So we're coming back through Arizona, just put hundreds of miles down, stop at a gas station. You put your hand on the portal and it's barely warm. What, yeah. What, what temperature did we get it up to? Um, I mean, when we were driving, we, we were coming back from um, Flagstaff. Flagstaff, Overland Expo West. I was guessing that the front portals were probably 110 degrees. The yeah. rears might have been 130. We did do a test two years, I don't know, a year or two ago where we drove through Arizona in the middle of summer. It was 115 degree ambient temperature outside. It's probably 130 on the blacktop. We were able to get the portal up to 176. But keep in mind, like we're running a Maxima full synthetic 7590 gear oil in this. That gear oil is barely starting to get working at 200. So running running this at 175 degrees, you're just not going to have any issues. Um, I remember I was having a conversation with Jason Shear after King of the Hammers, and he pulled temp stickers. He was first across the line. Um, Sorry, yes, he was first across the line at, at KOH in 2023. He ended up second place overall. And his max temp on his portals in race conditions was 192. So the heat thing is just kind of not an issue for anything that we do. Um, as long as you put oil in it, you're not really going to have any, any temp issues. And on the oil, people ask like uh, maintenance and stuff. You change it every about three, 4,000 miles, just like you would an oil change. There's a fill plug right at the top. There's a drain plug right at the bottom. You know, do your maintenance, change your oil, rotate your tires. When you pull it off, swap the oil out. Basically. Yeah, and that's one of those things too. I mean, if you look at like full retail, high-end, Maxima synthetic oil, costs you $10 to change. Um, this is not a $10 part. It never will be a $10 part. Do your maintenance, change your oil. You'll, you'll extend the lifetime of it. Um, we've got a set right now that's got 30,000 miles on it, a ton of highway driving, lots of off-roading, and we break them apart every 10,000 miles to kind of look at them. Um, I can tell you that they still look brand new. Gears look great. Uh, no issues. Just routine maintenance on stuff. What do you think? Should we dive into one? Well, let's let's cover the whole package. When you okay. get, you order a set of Jeep portals, you order a set of Tacoma portals, Bronco portals, it's all going to come kind of the same. So you're going to get four portals. Yep. This Jeep, it's an eight lug, one ton unit bearing, so it converts you to eight lug, yeah. one ton. Uh, you're getting a full float rear conversion at the same time as you bolt your rear portal on. Yep. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, all? so a full float, the main difference between a semi-float and a full float, and if you're not sure on this, I would tell you go on YouTube and just Google, like just search full float versus semi-float. The main aspect of that is a semi-float axle shaft carries both weight of the vehicle and torsional load of the vehicle. A full float axle shaft only carries torsional value up from that vehicle. So there's the weight is placed on a hub, which is on bearings. Um, so we have to have a semi-float rear axle in order for our portal to bolt in and register into that semi-float bearing cup. So we convert any semi-float to a full float. Um, it's definitely a stronger axle. Uh, it's a better setup. And like on the Jeep stuff, we, we reuse your brakes. We have a Willwood kit that we're coming out with. Um, that we've been working with them on. Um, Upsize rotors comes yep. with the kit. So on the Jeep stuff, you go to a 14 inch rotor in the front, 13 and three quarter in the rear. That's all included in the kit. Um, we give you 4340 through hardened axle shafts that we make in house. Um, it's a one stop. It, it comes with everything you need to do the whole conversion. So that kit, I, I wasn't quite mentioned, but it's your lift kit as well. It's 
giving you true ground clearance. We're lifting your axle, not your suspension. Yep. So the other main selling point on this stuff is you're keeping your factory ride quality. All your suspension geometry, everything stays the same. This portal, it is your lift. It's a 3.88 inch lift. It's a gear reduction, your 1.22 gear reduction. So it's a lift, it's a re-gear, it's an eight lug, one ton unit bearing. It's a full flow conversion, big brake conversion, all in one bolt-on package. Yeah, so, I mean, I say we pull it apart, yeah. show some of the internals. Yeah. Okay. So we've obviously pulled the bolts on this just so that we can do it, but literally it's, it's a handful of bolts that you'll pull off. Um, and this is what you're staring at. So if you notice here, we've got a bearing race that is attached to your knuckle. Same thing on this upright. And what we do here is this registers into your lower gear. And what it does is it'll tie this portion into the gear, which ties into the unit bearing, which ties into the box. So this whole unit becomes kind of a cohesive bearing stack and everything is held together tightly. Um, we run an O-ring set in a dovetail, so you can pull these apart, put them back together. They're serviceable. Um, we register everything on dowel pins. Uh, we do that because dowel pins are just more precision. Um, it's never a good idea to register on bolts. Bolts are not a precision surface. One thing that we didn't touch on that I think is worth talking about. So the bearing package that we run on, on our race is, it's an NJ206 SKF bearing. It's a cylindrical roller bearing. Um, that roller bearing has, it's the same bearing that's right here. So this bearing has a static, let me go my cheat sheet. So it has a static load rating of 8,200 80, pounds and a dynamic load rating of 9,800 pounds per bearing. Um, I should have touched on this when we're talking about straight cut versus helical cut. Uh, one of the big differences between straight cut and helical, and one of the main reasons we went to a straight cut, it's actually really the primary reason, um, we were nervous about gear noise when we first dove into this before I had the full picture of contact ratio. Now, helical cut gears, and the reason we didn't go helical, is helical cut gears generate thrust. And this bearing package that we have here cannot handle any thrust. The reason we had to go this bearing package is if you want to handle thrust loads, um, there's two different bearings you could use. Or there's, I guess there's three. There's angular contact. We won't discuss that because they're very expensive. You could go tapered roller. The problem with tapered roller bearings is they really need to be preloaded and it's not the, really the best bearing for this application. Then your third option would be a deep V-groove ball bearing. And so we looked at deep V-groove ball bearings and the problem with those is they just can't handle what we thought were appropriate loads. So, to put things in perspective, um, the cool thing about bearings is if you pull a bearing number, so I gave you the bearing number that's in here, it's an NJ206. So that's a flange cylindrical roller bearing. The key there is 206. So you can cross that over same dimensions in a deep V groove ball bearing. That's gonna be a 6206. Now a 6206 bearing Remember, this had a static load rating of 8,200 pounds. A 6206 static load rating is 2,500 pounds. So when you start talking about, and then a dynamic load rating of this would be 4,500 pounds. So in a dynamic load situation, you're half the strength of this NJ bearing. And we were pretty certain that we were going to exceed loads of um, a traditional ball bearing. And if you're not going to control thrust, you can't run, you just can't run a helical gear set. Um, there's kind of a reason that straight cut gears became so prevalent in racing is without having to accommodate for thrust loads, you can essentially run 
gears that will float. And when I say float, they're floating like the thickness of a sheet of paper. It's not a lot of float, but there's just enough float that those gears no longer need this massive, strong housing to handle all these thrust loads. So if you look at racing transmissions, they're primarily, I think every race transmission, especially on track, is going to be straight cut. Um, it's because they can build the cases to only handle vertical or, or in this case, what would be considered a radial load. And it just simplifies everything. When you're trying to deal with radial and axial loads, your bearing selection becomes really difficult. And it's either, in certain circumstances, it gets very expensive. In others, like in ours, we couldn't physically find a bearing package that would handle the loads that we were convinced were going to be generated based on what we saw in racing. And on every product that we make, I want something that can be developed in racing and then brought to, to mass market. If it's good enough for this, it's always going to be good enough for this. this the opposite is not really true. Um, I didn't want a product that was barely good enough to maybe handle Jeeps on 37s and then fingers crossed that the gear set lives. Um, to date, I can confidently say We've never had a single gear failure on any of our Jeep portals. Um, racing is racing, I can tell you. <laughs> We've had a couple uh, interesting circumstances. Um, don't need to dive into that, but we've we've seen a lot. You see a lot of stuff in racing, and and in racing too, people will push things. Um, they don't really care if everything breaks. They don't. There's trying to win a race. You're trying to win a race. You're out there to race. Um, so. Gear set, bearing package, all of this, you've got an input gear, power comes into this through the axle shaft, and it's split between two idler gears. Um, this doubles your contact area, and then brings you down, again, doubling the amount of teeth that are in contact in your lower gear. It just makes for a lot stronger package. And Essentially doubling compared to a three gear setup. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, well, you're doubling your surface area. Um, and then, you know, we run on everything. So on, on both the Jeep stuff, Toyota and on Bronco, we're all 35 spline on the lower gear. Um, we just bore and broach, all of our unit bearings are broached to 35 spline. Um, and we just do that. There's your 35 spline output. Uh, because since we're making everything here in house, it's pretty easy for us to just cut a 35 spline axle shaft. We do that all the time. Um, don't really necessarily see a need to go 40 spline. And in circumstances where you think you might be harder on stuff, we can do 300 M stubs. Um, we've done that in the past. But you look inside the portal and it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. Um, we had Toyota Walnut Creek race this package at yep. King of the Hammers. Yeah, so there was uh, a forerunner that raced this at King of the Hammers, and they were on a Jeep unit bearing. They didn't care about ABS. So we took this same unit bearing, drilled it to six on five and a half, and they were essentially running a Jeep style portal box with a Marlin Crawler RCLT upright. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, I think they were 15 miles from the finish and they broke something on the steering rack. Had a steering issue. They had a steering failure and that ended up taking them out of the race. But it was good because we logged a bunch of miles with them um, on this and got to put it through some race yeah. paces. Like we, we race this stuff. We can now say we have raced a production <laughs> platform. Yeah, so. and this is not developed as a race product, but it is good to be able to say, yes, we've raced on it. Um, and that helps us with you know, development because when we see something that's raced, we'll pull it all apart and we'll look for stress cracks or we'll look for you know, areas of fatigue or failure. And that helps us in our whole product development. So, you know... I think that there's definitely some value in saying, hey, we have a product that we race on, because um, it does matter. 
And not only raced, raced at King of the Hammers. Yeah, yeah. That's... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of you, I'm sure, if you're watching this, you follow Ultra 4. Um, King of the Hammers is not really like other races. I can tell you that there's a lot of debate between who's harder on things, Trophy Truck or Ultra 4. And I'll give you an answer. It's Lauren Healy. It's, <laughs> <laughs> there, we deal with a lot of teams, and I'm not going to dive into specifics. I will just tell you that Lauren Healy is harder on his stuff than any other racer I've ever come across. And so when you're having a debate of who's harder on things, trophy trucks or ultra four, it's ultra four, flat out. Like it's not even close. I get that they're doing 140 through the desert in a 7,000 pound trophy truck. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's not as violent and it's not as hard on components as ultra four guys. Um, so you got a little look into the internals. Um, is there anything that we missed? Um, just to, uh, a, a little bit to reiterate on bearing package. Again, this bearing is the same one we run in the race stuff. Yeah, so the NJ206 is literally the same bearing that's in this idler gear. So while, well, and here's another comment on that. So if you look at, see how we have two idlers here, these bearings do not see equal forces. Um, and this I will dive into a little bit. It gets kind of complicated, but we run an NJ206 bearing on both of the idlers in this package. The idler gears see the most force from, um, if you're looking at load forces on upper gear, idler gears, lower gear, uh, it would be the forward drive side idler gear because what happens is, so we have a pressure angle on the tooth profile on this gear. And if you look at all the forces that go into when this is turning, then these are spinning. And then how do those forces calculate out? You have essentially adding forces on one side, subtracting forces on the other because of the pressure angle of the tooth. So, and I'm making these numbers up, but it'll, it'll, makes sense. So if this gear set here is seeing 20,000 pounds of load, this one might only see 12,000 pounds. Um, these do not see equal, so the, the gears see equal forces, the bearings do not. So you have adding and subtracting forces um, based on the vector component of that radial load on that gear set. Um, so the bearing package in this is super critical and flat out, like we just couldn't, based on our calculations, there was no ball bearing that would handle the loads we wanted. Because if you look at how tight everything is, you can't really go much larger on bearings. Um, we, but we also knew that the NJ206, it works in this. So if it works in this, you're never going to convince me that you know, I get this a lot. Guys are like, oh, I'm really hard on my stuff. And I kind of nod my head and I play along with it. You're not as hard as Lauren Healy is on that setup. And so if it lives for him and he's never had an idler bearing wear out or fail or anything, if he can't break it, you can't break it. And if you do, go ahead, weed this thing. And if you manage to damage housings or knuckles, we just tell you lifetime warranty on that stuff. Um, people always ask about our gear set warranty. I'll tell you, if you're the first person to break it, I'm probably just going to give you brand new ones, no questions asked. I am going to want the old ones back because I'd love to see how you did it. Um, but we are not going to offer a formal gear set warranty because ask Spicer what their gear set warranty is. Ask Dynatrack, hey, what's the warranty on my gear set going into my rear housing? Um, I'll tell you that we've never had a gear failure and I'll tell you that if you do have a gear failure, contact us, but gears are such that that's a wear component. Um, do I think you'll get a hundred thousand out of a set? Yeah, absolutely. Um, how much more? I don't know. Um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you they're going to last forever because a ring and pinion doesn't last forever, but this is a, a rolling gear set, whereas a ring and pinion is a hypoid so it's a sliding gear these are not going to wear like a ring and pinion does um, 
And a race proven gear set at that. Yeah. Yep. So on the Jeep stuff, we've kind of gone through most of it. Um, yeah. One, the... one more thing. Everything we do is ABS compatible. Yeah. We have we use factor wheel speed sensors. There's not going to be any lights on the dash. Everything's going to plug right in. Yeah, and when we say factory wheel speed sensors, what we mean is we're giving you a Mopar wheel speed sensor. Um, on the Toyota stuff, we actually modify a factory Toyota wheel speed sensor. Um, and without diving into that too much, if you're familiar with the Toyota stuff, you know that the wheel speed sensor comes out and does a hard 90. We can't have it come out and do a hard 90 because there's not room, but we do use a factory Toyota wheel speed sensor, which we modify and pot ourselves and have a pigtail come off. And so you're still getting the factory wheel speed sensor reading a factory magnetic encoder on your Tacoma. So again, full ABS compatibility on the Bronco, we are using your Bronco factory wheel speed sensor. So we're not providing you a wheel speed sensor. You're using the one that your Bronco came with and it reads our magnetic encoder in our package. So when we're talking about ABS compatibility, we're not tricking your Bronco into like thinking anything. We're, we're physically using the factory wheel speed sensor in it. And that is something I think is, is worth noting because when you're talking about ABS compatibility, there are ways that you could trick the factory ABS system. We don't want to do that. So when you're stuck and you, let's say you snag a wheel speed sensor or you're taking something apart and you rip a wire, you can go to your dealership and buy your factory ABS sensor. I guess not on the on the Tacoma, you're gonna to have to get one from us because we modify it, but on the Bronco or on the Jeep, you're literally walking into your local dealership and buying a factory wheel speed sensor if you were in a jam where you needed one. Um, the Toyota one, we're playing around. There's a potential that we might be able to use a Tundra wheel speed sensor down the road, but they're not really readily available yet. So we're sticking with the factory Tacoma one and we'll have plenty of those in stock. Um, but the main thing is um, factory protocols and all of the, um, the wheel speed sensors are, are OE. All right, so on the Tacoma stuff, let's talk specifically IFS portals. So solid axle, you know, you get your lift below your axle, giving you true ground clearance, but that's a solid axle. So let's talk IFS. Sure. So I guess the easiest way to explain this is a portal on an independent suspension is not really a lift. It can be a lift. Um, I should clarify that. It's not necessarily a suspension lift. It has to be a CV lift. So essentially you have input gear, drop and output gear. And so your lower A arm currently comes in right about here. Now you could lower it down three and a half, four inches and put it right back into the factory position. And so you would get no suspension lift and a ton of CV lift. It might be kind of weird. Um, but the important thing there is, and, and I, I want to clarify this. Like we actually tell people on our website that this is a 3.88 inch lift on the front end. It's not actually true. Um, this is a 3.5 inch lift with, or 3.45 with, with the remaining balance as an additional C, CV lift. So we found the happy spot that we wanted to put the lower control arm. We set it there call it three and a half inches. And so if you look at a factory Toyota versus our Tacoma, factory Tacoma versus our Tacoma, 30 inch tire versus 37 inch tire, the CV angle on the Tacoma that I have is actually a little bit higher and a little flatter than it was from the factory. And we really did that based on where we wanted to see that lower arm. So all the pivot points are still based on OE geometry. You still have a provision to put your factory sway bar in. 
this is still a factory pivot point. Um, but that number, 3.88, that's your center line to center line correct. of your gear separation. It is. The A arm is just slightly higher. So, you know, on the rear, on a solid axle, you can't control that number. You've got a shaft coming out and you've got your final drive and whatever that gear center is, is totally dictated. Now, when you look in here, we really wanted to give the portal the minimal amount of lift. And I'll be honest, 3.88 is what we settled on. I really wanted 3.5. I would be happier with, three, with just a solid three inches. But we can't get a gear set that will be strong enough given those packaging constraints. So we went with 3.88 because we know that that gear set is super strong. Um, I would love a combination of suspension and portal lift. Uh, but I can tell you that like on our Bronco that we're putting portals on this week, we think we're going to fit a 38 bone stock. So that kind of gives you an idea of where we're going to be at. Um, you start going more portal lift than that. I don't see the benefit. No, and, and I see arguments for and against a portal in a solid axle. Um, if your goal is to run Rubicon, there's nothing better than a portal. Um, if your goal is to bomb through the desert, you're, you're somewhat limited because you can't get the up travel you want unless you go a really big tire and additional suspension lift. So it's kind of a, it's kind of trying to find the happy ground. Now, on an independent suspension, um, I don't see any other good way of lifting an independent suspension other than a portal. And I think this is a good intro to talk about shocks and long travel kits on independent suspension and why the portal is a better option than a long travel kit. Mm -hmm. So the problem that I see with long travel kits is, um, and this is a is just a general statement, is when you go to a long travel kit, you are getting all up travel, almost no droop. So let's say you get 12 inches of wheel travel out of your Tacoma in a long travel kit. It's not six up, six down. It's probably more like nine up and three down. And the problem with that is you have to crank that suspension. And the reason you go long travel is because you're trying to lift the thing to put a big tire on. And now your A-arms are at this angle and you're starting out at say a 15 degree angle and you can only go to say 22. What about the CV angle? The CV angle is, is already going towards max. And so the reason that you're only gonna get say three inches of droop out of a long travel kit is because the CV is your limiting factor. So what happens then is now you're talking about a funky ride height. And I think one of the things that's so commonly missed is when you're doing that, you're running a, a heavy spring to, to put that vehicle, you know, lift it at that angle, or you can run a long soft one, but now you get into coil bind issues and we're not going there. So you're running a heavier rate spring, which gives it a harsher ride. And the biggest effect that you'll feel is with only three inches of down and say nine inches of up, as you're blitzing through the desert the front end is constantly being pulled to its limit straps or using the shock as a limit strap. And what happens is um, that shock will end up going to limit and it'll pull the, the nose of the vehicle down because the suspension is no longer working. And so gravity takes over and it pulls the nose of the vehicle down and it inherently makes the ass end of the vehicle want to buck. And when you're getting into shock setup and you talk with like Fox or King, and when they're setting up a suspension for racing, the number one critical component is where is that piston sitting in the shock stroke at ride height. And so that is like one of the most critical features is when you're designing a shock, you literally sit down and chart out where does your piston sit at ride height. And there is not a single race car that is set up properly in the world for off-road that would set up the suspension where you get 20% droop and 80% up travel. It just doesn't work. 
So where a long travel, you're just stuck with that because there's so many constraints. I'm going to argue that a portal, given let's say I get nine inches of wheel travel out of this, I'm getting basically equal up and down. I'm going to get more droop out of a portal than you would out of a long travel kit. And so it's more about ride compliance. So while you're going to get more wheel travel out of a long travel kit, you're going to get better travel or more compliant travel out of a portal kit. Because at the end of the day, you're trying to fit a big tire on. You don't really want your suspension sitting at a 15 degree angle. You'd much rather have it at a zero. And I'll contend that this will ride night and day better both on and off road over a long travel kit. And this is factory suspension geometry. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's face it. There are, there are better ways to set up geometry for strictly off-road use. But if you're buying a strictly off-road product, it's that right there. Mm -hmm. If you want to go racing, that's the product. I think that if people are honest with themselves, and, and it's funny because I've had this conversation with guys at Fox, if you set up a vehicle to ride good on road, it's going to work fine off road. And, you know, it's like if you've ever gone shock tuning, you'll tune the vehicle for the speed that you want to run at. And so a race car might ride like crap at 45 miles an hour through whoops if you tune it for 70 miles an hour through those same whoops. So, it's really, you need to be honest with yourself and go, okay, where are you going to spend most of your time? Well, if it's, say, 70% on-road, which I'd probably contend it's 90%, if you drive your vehicle to the trail and back, you're probably 95% on-road, 5% off. Why would you not set your vehicle up to ride good on the street, knowing that it'll work just fine off-road? And that's really where this product comes in. I mean... I get emails where people are like, well, you know, I want something hardcore and this and that. I, hey, man, if you want to run a 42 and hammer it with 800 horsepower, go for it. We got a product for that. Um, this is a bolt-on application. And if you want to go race, I mean, if you want to race on this, I wouldn't stop you. I would tell you that if you're going to race 4600 class, um, we will have more 4,600 builds coming out on this kind of stuff. Is it pushing the limit of it? I don't know. We, we haven't broken one in a 4,600 race car yet, but that's why we make this stuff. So you'll see 4,400 and next year 4,800 on that stuff. Um, but you really just have to figure out, like, what's the application you want and be honest with yourself, like, are you going to drive it on the street? Because I like driving my Jeep on the street. It rides great. Factory suspension. I love driving the Tacoma. Yeah. It rides great. Factory suspension. So it's really what it comes down to is uh, we try and keep factory geometry because these OEs spent tens of millions of dollars developing it. We don't really want to throw it out the window. We think it's probably good enough for 99% of the people out there if they're honest with themselves. And you can throw a shock on it and tune it to whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, the Tacoma that I've got, we put Fox 2.5 Performance Elite Series. That shock gets an extra, I think it's one inch at the wheel because they're able to change shock length slightly. So I get an extra inch of travel. And I mean, that thing rides amazing. I, I drove in a quote-unquote long travel Tacoma three weeks ago up in Big Bear. And then I had that guy, I trade, trade vehicles, he drove in mine, it rides a whole lot better. Um, it's, it's a lot more plush, a lot softer, and I still jump mine coming down, or coming back up from Pioneer Town. There's, there's this rolling section where I might have been going a little <laughs> faster than I anticipated and launched the thing, um, and it handled it great. So we have our Tacoma platform. Yep. It's out. We're, we're running more through the shop. We'll have some, uh, some sets out in the next about six weeks. Yeah. So right behind that is Bronco. Uh, we have a Bronco downstairs. We are putting portals on right now. Yep. Um, 
Can you talk about that platform? Uh, the Bronco is one step forward, two steps back. Yeah. Uh, the Bronco's, Bronco's complicated um, because of all the electronics involved. Um, obviously, the, we've, we've got a, a bit of history in the Bronco program. Um, our portals are on the 4600 Broncos. Um, our race portal. Our race portal is on the 4600 Bronco. Uh, we now have in testing a bolt-on version. Essentially, from where you're standing, the upright on Bronco, it doesn't really look much different mm -hmm. than Tacoma. Yes, it's different geometry, but for all intents and purposes, when you look at the two side by side, you'd be hard pressed to tell them apart. Um, so you're gonna get a full billet aluminum 7075 upright. Um, I should mention this. So one of the reasons we machine an aluminum upright is if we were to make the box separate and have that bolt onto an upright, you're a lot wider. And packaging and width is something that's really difficult. And at the end of the day, you've got a bearing on each side, plus a gear, plus an aluminum case. Those plus a are unit bearing. Plus a unit bearing. Those are all fixed things. We can't change that. So this setup adds three and a half inches aside. If you were to make the portal separate and bolt it onto, say, the factory upright, you're going to be five inches aside, probably. As well as still having your factory upright. We're and using a 7075 billet upright, we know well, is bulletproof. Well, and let's clarify this. So the material used on this is identical to the material used on this. Lauren, well, let's see, we've got probably 20 plus vehicles on this upright. Mm -hmm. I hope I don't <laughs> jinx myself here. We have never had a single upright break. Mm. And Eric Husted was one of the first trophy trucks. I think he was the first vehicle to ever adopt our four gear stuff. He's four years in Still racing. Still racing. Won yesterday or Saturday. Oh, he the did? legacy race, he won. So he's, he's still racing on the same set of uprights that he lost a lower control arm bolt at San Felipe at the 250 last year. And the bolt started working its way out and ended up wrecking the misalignments and wallowing a few things out. That's still the same upright that he raced on last weekend. We were able to remachine, open up those holes, and put a new spacer in there for him. And he's still racing on that same upright. He's still also running the same gear set. Yeah. That's a four-year-old gear set. And that's, that is not a slouch truck. That is a Dugan's full big block race motor. It's probably 900 horse. So from a durability standpoint... That's why we're like, yeah, lifetime warranty on the upright. You're not going to break the upright because we don't break it over here. Um, so on all of our knuckles, uprights, that stuff, you'll see that the color is slightly different. That's because we run 7075 on all of our uprights. On boxes, we run 6061. It's just what we've done forever. And again, we've never had a box failure um, we don't see issues on that stuff. Mm. So Bronco uprights, um, real similar in design. The Bronco is very close to Toyota as far as release. Um, we'll open that up to orders in a couple weeks. On our mailing list? Make yep. Sure you're, uh... Yeah, subscribe to our mailing list and you will be notified before we release anything through any other social media or, or any other avenue. Um, we always hit up our mailing list first as kind of a thank you for, you know, giving us the ability to contact you directly. Um, we don't ever release anything until we've tested it personally. We don't really use other test vehicles unless you're a racer. And then you already have a relationship with us and you probably already are on our race stuff. And then like, yeah, Lauren will get a set of portals before you guys. Sorry, <laughs> but... We use guys like him because if he doesn't break it, you're not going to either. Um, I think that's a, I'm always cautious making blanket statements, but 
that's a pretty solid statement to make. Because mm -hmm. um, the guy just destroys things. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, I mean, that gives you a bit of insight why we do what we do, um, a kind of a, an in-depth look at our gears. Uh, I think it's worth noting, so everything you're looking at, we make in-house. Um, a couple exceptions are on all of our race stuff, we buy a Spider Tracks unit bearing. Why do we do that? Because that's a race proven quality product, and Spider Tracks is a great company. There's no reason for us to make that. We would rather partner with somebody who's got a great reputation and put their product on our stuff. Um, our bearing pack that we run on the Jeep is custom made by a company out of Ohio. Um, it took us quite a while to develop this and super happy with the quality that we're seeing from this. So this is not a, this is not a modified or an off the shelf bearing pack. This is custom made by us. They're the largest bearing pack manufacturer in the country. Um, and we now have these in stock. And so this stuff is, is working out well on Tacoma. We are currently using a Tacoma bearing pack. It's from SKF. We have to modify that. Um, I think that's going to change in the future. We're looking at potentially going to a larger kind of a one ton bearing pack, but the Tacoma bearing that we run right now um, seems super good, durable, and I don't foresee any issues with this. Um, but we're looking at a couple different platforms for cross compatibility. Um, but the reason we go unit bearings, it kind of revolves around all the patent stuff we've done. Um, a wheel bearing makes a lot of sense. It's, it's strong, it's reliable, it gives you a three bearing lower. Um, I think that's huge as opposed to just going with, you know, some of the real old stuff that we did you got a, a bearing in front and a bearing behind the gear. Um, running a third bearing in there just increases your load capacity and it's a stronger package. Well, on top of that, the wheel bearing accepts your wheel speed sensor. Yeah. It has a tone ring in it. Yep. So it's, we use it so we can also plug a wheel speed sensor right into yeah, it. Yeah, and ABS compatibility. I mean, let's be honest, if we're gonna sell a product and it's not going to be ABS compatible, I'll just flat out tell you that that's not a product that we would ever sell. Um, so guys are like, hey, I want to buy race stuff and bolt it onto my, my Jeep. I'm not going to make that. I'm not interested. Um, that's a race product built for race cars. That doesn't mean that it's, you know, if money is no object to you, I'm still going to sell you this over that. And if you want to run 800 horsepower through it, I'm gonna tell you go for it. Um, I'm not gonna to try to sell you a race product unless you are strictly racing. So yeah, as, as this stuff develops, I'm sure we'll make more portal videos. I guess one thing I would say is if there's something that you guys wanna see that we're not covering here, that's you, what the comments are yeah, for. Leave it in the comments, we're always there. You know, let us know what, you know, if you have other questions, we have answers. Yeah, um, one thing I will say is last week, Snail Trail 4x4, I did a podcast with them, and we dove pretty in depth, I think maybe even more so, into some of the gear stuff and gear development and bearing packages. Um, that was a good podcast, I think. I haven't listened to it yet. Um, but it was super fun talking with those guys. Uh, we'll throw a link to that in the comments below. Mm -hmm. And yeah, anything that you want to see, I'm a big fan of opening products up and showing you how stuff works internally because one comment that I'll have is the mark of a well-engineered product, in my opinion, is something that is simple and elegantly designed. And when you look into our portal and you start tearing it apart, one thing you'll notice is, wow, it's pretty basic. And my comment on that is, yeah, I mean, when you start to tear it apart, you're not seeing 50 things fall out and pins and this and that. 
it's a, a well thought out, simple bearing package around a good quality gear set packaged with, you know, good quality machined parts. Everything you're looking at here, we make in house with one exception is we blank out all of our gears and the teeth to our gears are hobbed in, by a company up in Los Angeles. Um, our gears are heat treated in Los Angeles um, and then we finish all of our bearing surfaces. So if you look at this gear, you'll see shiny surfaces, dull surface. We have a whole shot peen process that we go through and then we finish all the bearing surfaces after heat treat so that we maintain concentricity and you get a quality precision product. Um, yeah, anything else? Throw questions in the comments and we'll get yep. to them. Like and uh, subscribe to the YouTube and uh, we'll have more videos out soon. So thanks guys.